This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This week in virology, episode number 293, recorded on July 9th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Coming to you today from Melbourne, Australia. I'm at the annual meeting of the Australian Society for Microbiology, another ASM to make things more confusing. We have the ASM in in the US. And I've grabbed four virologists from here off the program to give you a little sense of what it is to do virology down under. And to my right, from the University of Queensland, Paul Young, welcome. Welcome to um, Melbourne, Australia. Thank you. Well, my first visit to Australia, period. Yeah, well, we're putting on all sorts of weather for you out there. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good one. The weather, you know, on Twib, we always talk about the weather, so. (laughs) I know, that's why I'm looking out the window. It is raining, right? Yeah, Yeah. but it was fine yesterday, and possibly earlier this morning. And it's likely to be fine this afternoon. It, uh, It is winter here, right? That's it correct. Is. Even though it's July, it's uh, winter. Well, with it, while the weather is coming up, 11 degrees Celsius and rain today and tomorrow and Friday is pr- predicted. Oh, well. If you had more weather like this, Paul, you wouldn't have a problem with your mosquitoes. <laughs> 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 also joining me uh, to Paul's right from the Burnett Institute, Gilda Tashtan. Tashtan, yes. Tashtan. Yeah, pleasure to be on Twiv. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And you're, you're the reason I'm here. You originally emailed me yeah, a long time ago. And you said you should come to this meeting. Yes, and I'm glad you did. And I asked Steve Goff, who you worked with, my neighbor, and he said, yeah, you should go to Australia. That's right. And well, he, you know I did a postdoc with Steve, and, of I, know, course, and I know of you from there. Yeah. And I actually emailed Steve to work on you to come over. So he, <laughs> he said I should spend some real time here, and, you know, take two weeks and go traveling around. But of course, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Next oh, well. time. Yeah. Next time. I hope to come back. Good. Next to Gilda from the University of Queensland, Alex Kromik. Is that correct? Almost, yeah. <laughs> How would you say it? Uh, Kromik, have you, Kromik. Um, all English speaking people say Kromik. Kromik. Yeah. Kromik acid. No, not <laughs> quite, but uh, the Russian <laughs> style is, is quite different. So it's, anyway, it's, welcome to TWIV. It's my pleasure. I understand you listen. Yep, I do listen to TWIV and I really enjoy it. Good. And finally, but last but not least, also from the Burnett Institute, Melissa Churchill. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you, Vincent. Really and glad. no, I don't listen, <laughs> but I will from now on. Oh, that's fine. You don't have to either, but we're happy to have you. You are the People in my lab were horrified to find that I didn't know what TWIV was. So. That's okay. <laughs> it's not a problem. Uh, let's see. We well, have, we're going to talk all about what you guys do. We have about an hour and a half here. Um, but first, I want to find out a little bit about um, your backgrounds, where you were born and raised and educated. Let's start with you. Okay. Uh, Brisbane. I was uh, born in Brisbane. I'm, I'm, I'm now working in Brisbane, but uh, I had a bit of a sojourn in um, uh, the United Kingdom as well. So uh, <clears throat> my science career started as a, an undergraduate. I wanted to be a chemist, but first year chemistry cured me of that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I wanted to be a pharmacist. I eventually found my way into microbiology. It was the mid 70s and uh, I started university in 73 and uh, it was right at the start of the genetic engineering revolution and it, it was an extremely exciting time. Uh, I became a virologist because the um, genetic engineer at the time, the, the bacteriologist, uh, didn't have space in his lab. <laughs> so virology was the next best thing. But, That's uh, how it works sometimes. Yeah, all of it? our careers seem to follow these paths and uh, did an honours at um, the Queensland Institute of Medical Research. One of my first mentors there, Barry Gorman, taught me about what inquiry was all about mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I, I loved it uh, and it ended up not... Uh, as a postdoc, but to do my PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 1978. Stayed there for uh, 11 years, as it turned out. Uh, Is it to get a PhD? 
Not, not, didn't take me 11 years, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I got my PhD and then uh, that terrible thing happened. I was given a dilemma. Some of us, are, I mean, some people might think it was a great thing, but mm. in retrospect, I'm not sure. I was offered my own lab straight out from being a PhD student, uh, again to set up a molecular biology group and I was going to start working on dengue. But at the same time I had an offer of a postdoc with Mike Bookmeyer uh, mm -hmm. at Scripps and I often reflect on that. Mike and I are still friends and uh, often reflect on, on that opportunity missed. You didn't go. So I didn't go. So I stayed, hey, you're offered a, your own lab and yeah, do, sure, do what sure. you like. That's great. I, I sort of grabbed it. but extra skills you get from uh, going on a postdoc in other people's labs I think would have been of some advantage but so I stayed there as a lecturer and uh, eventually was attracted back to Australia because we'd had a couple of kids I didn't particularly want to raise them in London <laughs> and uh, I just happened to have an offer when I was at a conference in Canada uh, someone said look we're setting up this new virus research institute do you want to come back so I thought about it and did so Queen, that's where you are now since then? So since 1989 in, in Queensland, um, joined the University of Queensland in 91, mm -hmm. and so I've been there since, uh, and now head of, head of school. I spoke to someone yesterday, Mel Thompson, Melanie Thompson, mm -hmm. she said the same thing, and she didn't want to raise her kids in London, it's too mm. crowded. Mm. <coughs> of course, we're gonna insult a lot of people from yeah. London. Oh, right? it's a great place, I mean, I, I loved London. I, I thought I'd be in England for the rest of my life. I loved, I loved the mm -hmm. place so much. But it's those cold, wet days when you see the kids hanging around the laundromat. And I remember my days uh, playing in the sunshine out in the forest. And I went, no, no it's pretty that's, cold and wet out here, too. Yeah, this is Melbourne. Though. <laughs> <laughs> He's up north. It's warmer. Gilda, how about you? So I was born in Adelaide, which is west from here, an hour plane ride away. And essentially brought up in Melbourne, raised in Melbourne. When we were five years old, parents came over here. Uh, from my name, you can probably guess I'm Armenian ancestry. I have an identical twin a clone who's also a researcher, <laughs> we can go into that. Um, so in terms of my undergraduate, I actually wanted to be a pharmacist, believe it or not, and um, I guess luckily for me I didn't get the marks to get into the pharmacy college. <laughs> Shouldn't be um, advertising that, but I uh, started doing a Bachelor of Science and did all the, um, the, you know, the core, uh, core subjects, so maths, biology, chemistry and physics. And then in second year I did micro and I actually fell in love with microbiology and I thought that's exactly what I want to do. Uh, but I had to carry chemistry. So I actually majored in microbiology and chemistry. And then we have an honours year and uh, there you um, do a, a specialised research project and I picked a virology project with Ed Westaway working on Kunjan virus. I bet you didn't know that, no, Alex. I didn't. And, and, that essentially, <laughs> and that essentially set you know, my course as a virologist. Huh. So I actually fell into virology. And at the time I was doing my undergraduate and my honours, HIV came on the scene. So Francois Baron Sunusi and Luc Montagnier discovered HIV. And I thought, I want to work on that virus. So I was just hanging out for a job um, to work on that. I ended up at the fledgling Burnett Institute at Fairfield Hospital, which was at the time a uh, specialised infectious diseases mm -hmm. hospital. And um, the Burnett actually um, merged out of the, the virology or basic research virology activity that was going on there. And I started working on antivirals and actually um, and drug resistance. And I did my PhD a little bit later. So I was working as a research, mm -hmm. you'd call us some um, technicians, but I really wasn't a technician. I was working as a, really at a postdoc level. And I decided to do my PhD. And so we had um, our second uh, Burnett Institute director, John Mills, who's an American, who took me on. Our first, the inaugural director of the Burnett was in fact Ian Gust. I don't know if mm -hmm. you know Ian. Yeah, I do. And uh, yeah, so I, I did a project on um, HIV drug resistance and uh, then was successful in getting an NHMRC um, CJ Martin Fellowship, which is uh, funding for you to go off and do a postdoc wherever you like. So I did the tour around the United States to find you know, a lab I wanted to, go, to work in and I settled on Steve Goff, as you know, um, at Columbia University. The couple of reasons why, I guess, um, it's New York. Steve's a great, great guy. Um, and. Uh, you know, he's got this track record with his postdocs. If you do do work in his laboratory and develop an area of research, then you can take that with you mm -hmm. and set up your own lab. And I thought that was really attractive. Howard Hughes investigator, lots of money, do what you like. He's not a micromanager at all. Right. And uh, a lot of very smart postdocs there. So it was a fabulous time. I was there from mid-97 to the end of 2001. So I was there for 9-11 which um, took a little bit of the shine off, but um, you know, it was tremendous. And I was working on HIV reverse yeah. transcript days. So a lot of the work I did before in my PhD was more clinically orientated, 
but I wanted to do some more fundamental research. Right. And uh, Steve had the East 2 hybrid system going on at the time, which is a genetic assay to look at protein, protein interactions. And I still wanted to stay in HIV, but do more fundamental research. So we, so I set up this um, East 2 hybrid um, assay for looking at the interaction between reverse transcriptase, the two subunits of HIV reverse transcriptase. And I said, Steve, I want to do this. And Steve said, you know, he's very subtle. He said, oh, other people have tried that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, that made me more determined. And I systematically went and, and made the constructs and, uh, and I, I, you know, I got it to work, which was great because that opened up a whole new avenue in looking at the molecular interactions between those two subunits. A um, couple of PNS papers, which is very nice. And a nice serendipi serendipity finding because... Um, you know, at the time, you know, people looking at inhibitors of reverse transcriptase mm -hmm. because if you block dimerization, you block function. And, uh, you know, we're doing these two hybrid and there were some molecules that were, were supposedly inhibitors of uh, or destabilizers of the HIVRT. Mm -hmm. And we threw that into the East 2 hybrid system. But as a, a negative control, I had a drug in there called um, nevarapine, which is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase mm -hmm. inhibitor that blocks HIV. And that was a negative control. Okay, so you know the, stu the um, molecules I had in there didn't do anything, but the negative control actually came up yeah. positive. Mm -hmm. I'm going, what's going on here? Here's a molecule that's actually enhancing the interaction yeah. between the two RT subunits. So we, we characterised it further and found you know, the first chemical enhancer right. of RT dimerisation. Okay, so I'm going on too much, but anyway, no, after, I, after I finished there, I was recruited back to the Burnett Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, subsequently, we moved to a new campus because Fairfield Hospital closed mm -hmm. uh, because that was a um, specific infectious diseases hospital. And I guess, you know, that you just can't um, have specific hospitals anymore, inf infectious diseases. And recruited back to the Burnett, and I started, continued that line of research on looking at RT dimerization and um, the impact on virus replication because RT is expressed as a gag pole polyprotein. Um, and so we were looking at um, enhancement or the role of RT in the context of gag pole in assembly and maturation. But then I diverged out of there, so I do do a bit of RT work, but we can talk about that later because yep. I don't want to hog the time. Yeah, but, we'll um, we'll I've get into worked into work, into sure. got into HIV prevention and a bit of bat, bat retrovirus work. So. All right, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Now, Alex, you're not you're not an Australian, clearly. Uh, well, I am now. Now you are. <laughs> yeah. I am now. Since it's been a while, actually. But I was born and raised in uh, in Siberia. In, in Russia, in the city called Novosibirsk. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a large um, capital of Siberia, down south, between the, near the Mongolian border. Uh, so ever since I, uh, our biology uh, lessons in the high school, I was interested in becoming a biologist. I thought that's what I decided, that, that's what I'd like to do. Um, so I went to university in a neighboring uh, town called Tomsk and the biological faculty of that. So I did a degree in physiology. Um, and then I got a, a job uh, at the uh, uh, Center for Virology and Biotechnology at, near Novosibirsk called Vector, where I did my PhD in uh, molecular virology. I was developing the vaccine against uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus using vaccine virus as a vector. So I got my PhD there, and I was, I was, I was doing PhD part-time, so I was working as research assistant and a PhD for about five years uh, to complete the PhD. So then I um, had a brief uh, a year postdoc in Canada, and it's a fascinating story how I got there. Where in Canada? Given, uh, in the University of Ottawa, uh, in, with um, CEO Kang, mm -hmm, working yeah. on Hantan virus expression of Hantan virus protein using Bacillus virus system. That's where the ASV is next year, yep. and he's the host. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, it's, it, was a, it was a very intense uh, uh, sort of time for me, yeah. straight out of the Iron Curtain country into an open world of Western societies. Uh, yeah. It was um, a very steep learning curve of English and, uh, and, and uh, uh, customs and everything else, so it was very um, intense, but I really enjoyed that. So, but unfortunately, that, that job finished after a year because uh, the company that the money from the company was used to hire me, and the company got bankrupted, so the money were gone. So I was looking for a job, and I um, 
came across this advertisement in Nature for the job in this new center, virology center in Brisbane, hmm. uh, to work <laughs> with uh, with Ed Westaway on uh, on the Kunjin virus, on the West Nile virus, or Kunjin virus. So I said. Yeah, I've never seen kangaroos. I've never seen, um, <laughs> you know, crocodiles. Or uh, I'd like to go to Australia. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know much about Australia at that time at all. Um, Not if you expected to see a crocodile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brisbane. And, 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 and then the other attraction, of course, was that uh, that Ed Westerway was well known in the field at that time, and probably half of the references in my PhD thesis are his papers. So and uh, and. I told him that, and I, he obviously liked it. So <laughs> it was a risky, uh, uh, you know, it was risky to take me because I didn't have many papers at that time, uh, being straight from Russia, and, and uh, my postdoc in Canada didn't really um, come, you know, come to any any papers. Um, yeah. So it was risky, but um, I had a really great time at Saksuski Research Research Center of Brisbane, where Paul was. So it was a really vibrant place for the first few years. We used to get together at the tea room and discuss uh, the, the, you know, all the research and science. And Alex was known as the crazy Russian who partied hard. <laughs> He's pretty good on the dance floor too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, I can't deny that. It is what it is. <laughs> so Ed really uh, um, started my the working with Ed really started my career in the flyovars field. So and I, he was really great mentor. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago, but. Um, it was really great to be around him, and we had a, a real blast um, in, uh, in the research. Lots of papers with um, another postdoc at the time, Jason McKenzie, who actually did PhD in Paul's lab just before that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's all part of a big family. It was it was really exciting and really happy time. Um, then I got my own lab um, and um, and, uh, and a fellowship from NHMRC, and I decided to to relocate to the University campus at St. Lucia, which is a, a large and um, vibrant campus full of students, full of researchers, and now full of research institutions uh, that are, it's a really great environment now. So this is how I ended up. You're both at the same university? Exactly. Same, same university, same school. And next to each other. So you see each other. Labs are next to each other, essentially. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Gilda and uh, Melissa are both at the Burnett Yeah, we're at the Burnett, which is 10 minutes away from, from here. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So we, we have a great setup now in the school. Three, three virologists, three virology group working with, you know, three viruses. And Paul also worked with another virus yeah. as well. But great. So we have common interest, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's going really well. But you're now his boss, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> now he's my boss. Yeah. We don't try and talk about that. <laughs> so, Melissa, what's your story? My story, okay. Well, I was actually, I actually grew up in a place called Kilcunda, which um, is not a major city in Australia. It's um, a small country town, so I'm a country girl. Um, grew up in a dairy north, farm. North, west, it's down near Phillip Island. Anyone know where Phillip wow. Island is? Where the penguins are. Where the penguins yeah. are, and the koalas. penguins, koalas. And flies. Yeah. Flies. There's no flies down there. Oh, really? <laughs> no mosquitoes, anyway. No. Um, yeah, it's down on the coast. Down on the coast. Flies are um, terrible. And I, I actually um, started medicine and decided there's a hell of a lot of sick people when you're studying medicine. So <laughs> I sort of lost interest very quickly and ended up just doing a Bachelor of Science. Um, and then at the end of that, I wasn't really sure what, to, what, what I was going to do. I, I'd never done microbiology. I did a PhD in microbiology at Melbourne University. I have not had one microbiology lecture or one microbiology class. So um, it was more a, a, an arrangement that the Burnett had with um, the Department of Microbiology to have the, the external students go through that department. So my background's um, uh, biochemistry and botany which is very interesting. Um, good combination for studying transcription. <laughs> um, but yeah, I started um, at the Burnett after my honours year. I actually had a very, very bad first research assistant job that lasted two months at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And um, I was so desperate to leave that I got a job with the then um, Deputy Director, Richard Doherty, 
um, on PCR and I didn't know what PCR stood for. So <laughs> <laughs> that's when I decided to go study law because I was very good at convincing that, um, <laughs> yeah, I had no idea, but I was so desperate to leave. And I, re I really uh, fell in love with the Burnett. I mean, we, my first day there, I was shown my office, which was a, um, it was a portable. It was a portable cabin, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah, it was a portable port cabin, you know, like those old high school. And that was my office, my lab, and her PC3 facility. Oh, in the portable cabin. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, God, yeah. We, we, you know, between our PC2 and our PC3, we had a sliding door, which, <laughs> would, which would occasionally, no, no ante room, no nothing. Like, you could wave to Gilda as she's culturing virus, and you're out there just, you know, doing whatever, which, which, Interestingly, then became the tea room after many years, didn't it, Gil? Sorry? It became the tea room, remember, our lab? Oh, ultimately, yeah. Yeah, that was very interesting. So we're going to cut this bit later? No, no. <laughs> you don't want to make up a bit. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Oh, H&S have changed quite a bit since then, hasn't it? So then um, I, I became part of what they called the National Centre, and it was, it was the... I think it was a, the NHNMRC's response to HIV, mm -hmm. and they set up these national centres. There was one in Queensland, there was one in, in oh, there was one in New South Wales, and there was one in Victoria. And they had these program leaders, and um, it was kind of it was core money, so it wasn't sort of grant orientated and that sort of thing. And it was really to set up labs and train people um, to do HIV research. And I worked there for 12 months as a research assistant, and then I started my PhD. Um, on transcription, HIV transcription, um, and did okay. I mean, I, I didn't actually publish during my PhD, but somehow I got an NHMRC fellowship, which was interesting. Um, but they had a special initiative for HIV um, fellowships at the time to, again, train people, send people overseas and bring them back trained in HIV. And I took the opportunity, I went to SmithKline Glaxo, which we really had to push NHMRC to, to agree to because, of course, of course it's a commercial company. But the guy I worked for there, Marty Rosenberg, um, had been recruited from NIH and part of his recruitment package was that he was allowed to do some toy research. Mm. And <laughs> we were his toy research. So, pet, pet research. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pet research, yeah. So <laughs> completely probably. outside anything yeah. that, that um, Glaxo would want to do. And it was the most amazing place to work because the funding was astonishing, you know, especially for Marty's group. So, you know, you, the, the day I moved in there, they asked me what I wanted to order, and I'm like, well, I don't know, a pipette? No, a fridge, gel tanks, everything. They just, <laughs> you know, you just got your own of everything, and then the ones that were there before got donated to, I don't know, Penn State University or something. Um, and that was a great experience. It was really, Marty was um, quite a taskmaster, but I, I really learnt... Uh, a lot from him, um, especially do things now, not later sort of thing. Uh, Philadelphia was not the best place on earth to live, especially not Conshohocken. So um, after two years there, I had two years of my fellowship back at the Burnett. So I came back to the same lab and um, met up with Gilda again, which was lovely. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a um, uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, the National Centre was still going. Um, but it was folding, it was changing. Uh, I think um, HIV research was being put back into the pool where it rightly belonged. Um, I mean, the initial startup, of course, had to, do, had to happen, but then, you know, you had to competitively apply for funding. But at that time, the Sydney Blood Bank cohort of HIV patients was discovered, and um, the guy I was working for, Nick Deacon, was very instrumental in that, in that program. And I started working on that. Um, so I kind of fell back into that non-publishing um, commercial research. So we, we couldn't publish anything. Someone else owned it. It was a lot of work for what I thought was um, a difficult to publish area. So um, I was becoming very disgruntled with uh, research generally. And then um, we moved to the Alfred and we changed directors at that time. And I was actually doing a law degree on the side. Um, and I was kind of pushing towards a law degree and using my science to fund my law degree. And when Steve Wesling took over as director of the Burnett, um, he asked me to give science a year and to work for him. And that's when I fell in love with HIV and the CNS and central nervous system. And I've worked there since. Um, have my own research group, and uh, we have a couple of grants, and we basically look at HIV and the CNS. I've become very involved in the cure effort through my collaborations with Sharon Lewin, and the last couple of years I've been on a committee called the Global Strategy Committee. The International AIDS um, Society has a Global Strategy Committee, 
And that's just been enlightening. Um, you get to interact with people that you just read about, you know, people whose names you see, like Francois and, and um, Steve Deeks and all of these people that you see at conferences and, and then you're, you're, you're sitting down in a room and discussing things with them and they want to hear what you have to say. And so the Cure effort has revitalised um, CNS type research, HIV CNS type research. And um, I guess all reservoirs, you know, in particular the CNS, are important for the cure effort. So, so is in every individual with AIDS, does the virus get into the CNS? Um, well, you'd have to check the CNS of every patient to know that. Not all patients get CNS disease. So symptoms, right? Yeah, not they don't all get all get symptoms. But um, you know, we have patients in our cohorts where um, who have passed away from AIDS mm -hmm. um, and they can have encephalitis, like the, the pathology of encephalitis, but they've never had any neurocognitive mm -hmm. diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the brain's very interesting in that, you know, it's the old story where someone can get a javelin through their left frontal lobe yep. and be fine and someone else might and they're dead. So I think, you know, one size just doesn't fit all with the CNS. But we think the virus is getting in in, in a fraction of it's patients, a, it's, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, some people would argue that it gets in in all patients and just doesn't cause disease. Okay. So, so how does it getting in within a cell? Yeah. I mean, it, that's another that's another um, contra controversial point. Um, there's a number of models for the way it gets across the blood-brain barrier, whether or not it's brought in infected monocytes. Um, which then become perivascular macrophages, or is it, excuse me, directly into astrocytes through the blood-brain barrier, um, through the processes and, okay. and things like that. So they're, they're not 100% sure. So once a, once virus is in the CNS, we're talking about brain and spinal cord? Is yeah, right? yeah, anywhere in the CNS, yep. So does it infect other cells that are resident? Well, that is also controversial. <laughs> um, a lot of people don't think that astrocytes are infected. I strongly disagree with them. Having isolated about 10,000 astrocytes using laser capture mm -hmm. and doing triple nested PCR on them, I can guarantee you there are infected astrocytes. Um, macrophages, microglia, um, perivascular macrophages. Um, I've never seen neurons infected, um, but, but clearly um, it, the infection of astrocytes affects the survival of neurons. So that's where the dementia comes from and the neurocognitive How does it do pain. that? So the, is astrocytes well, astrocyte, get infected? Astrocytes are like the clean-up molecules of the brain and, and they're responsible for cleaning up and maintaining the, the homeostasis of the brain and yeah. make sure everything's happy. And so when you infect um, or when astrocytes become infected, uh, they don't carry out these functions. Okay. So tell us about your, your specific interest in HIV in the brain. What, what, what well, I look at transcriptional regulation, mm -hmm. basically how how is it, how is the virus regulated differently to the periphery, and we are finding substantial differences. We find the viruses that we pull out of the brain are very different to the viruses that are pulled out of T cells and mm -hmm. and macrophages in the periphery. They compartmentalise. They have different envelopes. They have different sensitivities to neutralisation antibodies, and um, and now we're finding that the LTRs are very different. So the way they're regulated is very different. Which of course it will be because astrocytes and other cells of the CNS have different transcription factors. So is that because there's a uh, bottleneck from periphery to the brain or is it when the virus gets in there it, it differentiates in yeah, a different way? Yeah, don't know. It, it's unlikely that it, that it evolves in astrocytes because mm -hmm. don't get viral production. You know, it's a, it's, um, you get transcription and you get the production of the multiply splice messages, mm -hmm. but you don't get the production of the full-length transcripts. There's blocks in all pathways. People identified rev blocks and um, translation blocks, transcription blocks. So you just don't get virions produced. So obviously you're not going to get evolution in those cells. Okay. But in macrophages and other cells where you do get virus, um, whether it's a selection for entry or whether it's evolution, we don't know. Okay. So today you talked about how when virus uh, integrates into astrocytes that the transcriptional levels are downregulated, right? They're just lower. They're the, lower. So, so the, the they're LTRs. They're zero, right? No. The, they're, they're quite a bit lower. They can be zero. Um, the viruses that we pull out, and most of the viruses that I pull out now are using laser capture um, microdissection, so taking 
um, autopsy brain specimens and pulling out single nuclei and pulling the, the LTR out of those cells, and, and that ensures purity. Um, they, they have very different LTRs, different regulatory mechanisms to those that we pull out of the periphery of the same patient. Now, why is that? Don't know. Okay. Can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> not, not really sure. I mean, it, it, astrocytes are more latent cells. You know, they, they don't they don't replicate uh, very much. They you know they don't replace. They're not very active. You know, it's could be a number of a number of reasons. You know? Can you induce uh, replication and, and in an astrocyte? Uh, um, yeah, you can. Yeah. And you get virus. Well, uh, in vitro, in people vitro, have yeah. done that. Yep. Yeah. Yep, definitely. They've infected and, and um, yeah, with TNF alpha and I um, can't remember what else, but you can produce virus. But whether or not that happens in vivo, I mean, how, how do you know? <laughs> well, as you said, you have to get brain tissue, and that's from, yeah. a, from a living person, and that's hard to do. Yeah, you know, I presented at a conference once, and the question was, are you going to do a follow up study? And I wasn't quite sure what part of autopsy <laughs> they missed, but, <laughs> but it makes it a little bit difficult. Yes, yeah, follow so. up. Right. So can, is there an animal that you could use to study this? Well, there are, there are some animal models, um, some shiv macaque models, and I believe that um, Victor Garcia from um, North Carolina has a mouse model. They're yet to be really well defined. I mean, if, if you want to get a neurological infection, um, then you have to use a, a neurotype virus. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think they've shown in these patients whether or not astros oh, sorry in these animals whether astrocytes are infected. So in Victor's case, um, he and he, he'll be talking in Melbourne uh, next week, but he's shown that there's virus in the brain, but he hasn't actually looked at whether or not that represents your true infection where you get astrocytes infected latently and and macrophages, or whether it's just an acute macrophage type infection. So. Um, so I would view the whole thing as an accident because it doesn't, the virus doesn't want to go in the brain. It can't spread from there, right? So it's the same with polio. Yeah, and possibly. So, I mean, isn't it true that in stem cells, HIV just goes in and it's shut off, right? That's what I learned from the Goff lab. Or did you? <laughs> is that, is that well, if you heard it from the Goff lab, Gilda should answer that is question. That right? No, I don't know anything about stem cells. I mean, there, there are... Well, ES cells as a model, yeah, the, the yeah, genome is silenced know. as soon as it gets in. Right. Uh, it's probably a protective mechanism for all viruses that go into a mm. stem cell because mm. you don't want to kill them. So I would, I'll bet it's a similar thing in astrocytes. They're just not permissive for um, this virus and probably related viruses as well that would get in there. It's a protection thing. I really doubt yeah. that they kill the astrocytes because, um, I mean, that, the problem with killing astrocytes is they don't replace and we, we've shown that you know up to 20% in particular regions not in the brain as a whole but 20% of astrocytes are infected and you kill 20% of your astrocytes you're really going to know about it so you know I guess may, maybe that is the mechanism in itself that you know they just go in they sit there they do a little bit of damage every now and then and then so maybe there are bursts of replication there's, de there's definitely no, not replication. There's definitely transcription, transcription? because okay. you get the products of the multiple splice species. So you get tat. Tat's a, a terrible neurotoxin. Um, okay. So yeah. So you know, um, you do get the products of the multiple splice species, and, and people have shown some uh, that it's very strongly linked. A uh, strong link between um, tat levels and, and dementia in okay. these patients. So in your title of your talk today, you had as a subtitle, Implications for a Cure. Yeah. So what, is, what are the implications? Well, I guess, I guess one, of, one of the problems with the cure strategies, and, and hopefully it won't be a problem, but I think it's something that we have to consider, is that um, what, what exactly do they want to achieve? If you're talking eradication um, or sterilizing cure, that's going to be very difficult to prove, um, you know, uh, short of pulling out someone's brain. And having a look, although in the Berlin, Berlin patient, they've actually taken some, I'm not sure if it's brain, but at least CSF samples and showing there's no virus there. But um, the other thing is, we don't know how the transcriptional activators work in the brain. We don't know if they get into the brain. We don't know if they're toxic in the brain. We, we know that there's a reduced penetrance of um, antiretrovirals to the CNS. So, you know, when, when they activate when they use these drugs to activate the virus in the patients to expose it, they then treat with antiretrovirals to, to make sure there's no further rounds of replication. Right, right. 
um, but you don't know what's going to happen in the brain. And if there are no further rounds of replication in astrocytes and the drugs do get in, but you're producing a lot of TAT, how, how do you know that? How do you measure it? You know, it's a very localised effect. And that's the same for any tissue reservoir. I mean, you know, spleen, lymph node, yeah. lung, yeah, yeah, yeah. kidney. How do you know what's going on deep in the tissue? And I think that's a real challenge for, for the cure researchers. doesn't mean it's not going to work, but, you know, there's, there's a lot to be done. Well, I guess that if you can, if you can achieve some kind of clearance in other tissues, then you'll just wait and look and yeah. see if oh, they absolutely. develop neurological absolutely. symptoms. And, right? and, and that's the thing. It may not matter. Yeah. And we're very much hoping it won't matter. You know, I, I think the problem is one size is not going to fit all. So, you know, currently, in order to study um, the brain of suppressed patients, you know, as I said in the talk, we don't have many of those tissues. Yeah. In fact, we have three, yeah. and I think that's all there are. We, we get our stuff, our tissues from the NNTC, the NIH-funded Neuro Tissue Bank in the States. And there's really only three brains in that bank that would fit the criteria where they're suppressed, they've been on antiretroviral therapy, but they died of something else. So. If you analyze those three brains and you find that there's no virus, that doesn't necessarily say that another six yeah, brains wouldn't sure. show the virus. <laughs> if you get a positive result, it's more definitive than a negative result, yeah. even though you're hoping it's negative. So some uh, current approaches are to take out peripheral T cells and cut out CCR5, for example, and put them back, yep. right? But this would have no impact on astrocytes, right? No. And so that would still be there. Um, well, but, but I mean, anything that... Uh, I mean, the antiretrovirals do um, work very well on the CNS disease, and that's probably through um, preventing reseeding. You know, if there's no virus in the periphery, um, it, it's rare to have um, CNS disease. It happens, but, you know, it, it is quite rare um, to have that. So, so basically, if we can excise proviruses from, you know, T cells, the, it will still have people with proviruses and astrocytes, and whether or not that's if a problem. If they're there now, you know, if, if you're right, a virally right. suppressed they're there. patient, they're, they're, they're still there. You know, I mean, um, I can't see how they're not there, but you know, right. let, let's hope. So they're going to, people will just live with these, and whether they're a big problem or not, yeah, we'll Yeah, and may we'll never see. be. Yeah. And let, let's hope that they're not, because certainly a functional cure is much better than lifelong antiretroviral yeah. therapy. You said to me in the talk, uh, nobody cares about neuroaids. <laughs> no, it's not. It, it's not that nobody cares. It's just very difficult to to um, to convince people that you know the viruses stop here. Right. Um, well, it was more difficult before the big cure effort got rolling, um, and I guess part of it is it's really difficult to do. You know, and, and it does raise questions, a lot of questions about the cure efforts. And, and, and I think the cure efforts are great, you know, they're, they're really good, but we just have to keep it a little tempered. You know, it reminds me of polio. We had a lot of polio in the U.S. and people would die and yep. they would do autopsies and look at where the virus was. Yep. So we learned a lot from that, yeah. but no one ever looked in living people and they had a monkey model, which helped yep. a lot too, but that's, that's harder. Yeah, it's hard, it's really hard to get brain samples off living people there. Little, I wouldn't give my... A little hesitant. I can imagine. <laughs> a little hesitant. Yeah. You know, and it's when, when you put in a grant, you know, to NHNMRC or something, and they say, oh, three brains, that's not going to show you anything. Right. Like three, when we get three brains, we're like, woohoo, we've got three brains. But, you know, I mean, a cohort of brains can't be 50. You know, it's just not, not going to happen. And, and luckily it's not, you know. We don't want it yeah, to be 50. Sure, sure. So you have to use people that have died in car accidents and all that kind of stuff. Or yeah, I, I think... Coincidentally, coincidentally infected with HIV. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. A, that's or in the US, though. You know, it's a I tough know, coincidence to have, isn't it? Or something. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that, that's, that's exactly right. You know, people that have died of something else, and um, which is a shame. Alex, yep. let's talk about West Nile virus. It's your love, right? Yes, it Your is. love is NS1, which is shaped like a heart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to live that down there. I found that a little disturbing, actually. Cool. <laughs> My wife finds it even more disturbing. <laughs> Paul gave a talk and showed a protein called NS1. And and, and outlined it like a heart. And he said, this is the love of my life. <laughs> it was okay until the two of them came together. I found that disturbing. So is West Nile the love of your life? It has been uh, for what? Almost 
25 years now. So yes, I, I love this virus, and um, we d we can do a lot with this virus now. That we have a lot of tools to to do that. So one of the things you talked about. So in in Australia, you have a virus, a West Nile called Kunjin, right? Yep. And I wanted to ask. So in the U.S., West Nile arrived in 1999, probably from Israel, right? Yep, most likely. When did when did Kunjin arrive here? We have no idea. No. Nobody knows that. It was first isolated in 1960. Yeah. Uh, and ever since it's been here, although it, it, the, the, it doesn't really cause much uh, much of a disease, so you don't. In, in you don't, people, right? In people, yes. So, but do people get infected? Uh, yeah, you get seroprevalence, uh, but it's it's a very mild uh, infection, so it's a really a naturally attenuated strain. So no CNS, no encephalitis. There's about five or six cases of mild en en encephalitis, although some of them are questioned. How many cases? Because it wasn't clear whether there was Kunjin or whether it was MVE. There's another virus in Australia that causes disease in humans, myovalli encephalitis virus. And in, in early days, it was difficult to, to distinguish those two mm -hmm. um, because they're fairly similar. Uh, but I think it, it, there hasn't been any cases of encephalitis and Kunjin in the last 10 or 15 How years. How many infections are we talking about? Thousands? Uh, it's hard to say because nobody does a, a proper sero seroprevalence okay. studies. Yeah. What about, what about lab workers? I mean, I remember I had to have a yellow fever vaccination when I did my honours. But, but the yellow fever is a, is a real disease. Uh, yeah, but I had to have a, no, 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 but to work on Kunjin in the lab, I had to be had to have a yellow fever. No, we don't. You don't, you don't have do that to, anymore. That to, was going back a while. Well, you don't have to be vaccinated. Yeah, though. apparently it was some sort of protection. Are you saying Kunjin is not a real disease? So my question is, you know, people in the laboratory. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't get us the funding. Yeah, exactly. What about people it in the laboratory? Is everyone people listening people to that? It doesn't kill people in Australia. Yeah. It does kill people in the U.S. and in Europe. If you were a horse, you um, wouldn't be saying that. But that's a different virus in the U.S. and Europe, right? It's quite it's a very similar virus. No, the U.S. and Europe are very similar virus. Right, but they're different from Kunjin, right? But they differ from Kunjin. And you showed a, a slide of many, many differences in amino acids in each viral protein, right? Well, it, it, many if you, if you do accounts, but on the percentage level, it's 2% difference. Yeah. It's not that but, huge, you know? When West Nile... Um, 99 was first sequenced. Uh, they even thought that they had a version that was of Kunjin yeah. in, in, in the States because that's that's what came up as the closest. Uh, yeah, right. It was something like 98% similarity. Uh, yeah, it, it is. I mean, two percent is not a big difference. You're looking at you know three four three thousand and four hundred and something amino acids, and out of those you get fifty to to seventy amino acid difference. So it's about two okay. percent. So you made recombinants between Kunjin and West Nile to find what's making it attenuated. And you study this in mice, is that correct? Yeah, the mouse model uh, is, is actually resembles closely the human uh, infections. Uh, and so the, the, more, the, more, the viruses that are more virulent in mice, like New York 99 strain, is also more virulent in humans. So we'd, we'd like to think that this is a, an appropriate model. How do you uh, inoculate? You inject IP or uh, different routes? We do inject IP. We also inject uh, in the foot pad, okay. which is a more natural route. Or you can also uh, inject directly into the brain if you want to study okay. whether the virus is, is really highly attenuated. You go and inject it into the brain. And if it doesn't cause disease, it's attenuated virus. So what um, proteins regulate the virulence? Uh, well, so far. Now, data suggests that that's uh, mainly non-structural proteins, mm -hmm. uh, because when we made the chimeric viruses between Kunjin and, and the New York 99 strain, the, the non-structural chimera came the most virulent, came down as the most virulent one. Still not as virulent as a, as a, as a New York strain, mm -hmm. so there's still some role for the structural proteins there as well. But the majority of virulence was associated with the non-structural genes. Um, okay. and and we and others published before that those genes are important in uh, in combating the interferon response. So we had studies previously uh, in collaboration with Mark Diamond's lab in the U.S., where we showed that the major reason for for the New York 99 to be more virulent than than Kunjin is the ability of that strain to suppress interferon response. So Kunjin doesn't do that as efficiently. Yeah. And New York does, and, and that appear to, appears to be the, the main um, sort of driving force behind New York. Yeah, Kunjin is pretty successful, right? 
Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't kill you. It doesn't kill you. So people. why does why does West Nile have? I can't ask why questions. What's the purpose? <laughs> <laughs> why? Why not? Why not? How come? Well, because in biology, you can't ask why because that's that's an existential thing. You have to rephrase it to be mechanistic. So, what is the purpose of? Uh, of two very closely related viruses, one being way more virulent, if the other spreads just as readily. So you can't argue that virulence is important for spread, right? Because Kunjin has done great. Yeah, well, at least so far, it's not uh, killing people. So I would say that the inhibition of immune response is probably an accident due to something else. It's collateral damage. Although um, we don't know what that is. That would be my guess. That's difficult to. You know, in bacteria, you can show that there are a number of examples where the ability of bacteria to do something that they need to do collaterally makes them more virulent. So the, the goal is not more, in more virulence to do this other thing, but it, it ends up... But you have to also keep in mind that uh, humans are really a dead-end host for this virus. Kunjin. Yeah, and, and the New York, and, and West Nile virus in general, uh, humans and, and horses are really a dead-end host because th there's not enough uh, virus in blood of humans or horses right, that's right. to allow mosquitoes to, to transmit it from, from those hosts. So the birds and birds are the major um, uh, reservoir for, the, for this virus. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, the New York killed, well, essentially wiped out all the American crows right. in the United States. Uh, so what's the, what do you mean, by saying it's a dead end, does that mean that, you know, considerations about transmission and virulence are... are it redundant? cannot be transmitted from, yeah. from, this, uh, from this host. And for, for the virus, from the virus okay. perspective, yeah. it's a dead end. So West Nile versus Kunjin in birds. Well, we're getting all kinds of noises here. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a hotel. <laughs> uh, in birds, are they both... Non virulent or virulent? No, the New Yorkers is, is much more virulent uh, in, uh, in crows and, and other bird species. And we've done these studies in collaboration with the CDC people, Aaron Brold and, okay. uh, and so Dick Bond. So it's clearly the New York is, is much more virulent in birds than So which birds in Australia? Uh, oh, egrets. Uh, the water birds, essentially. Water herons. Water, water herons, water egrets. Should we uh, just get rid of them all? Yeah, but they don't, they don't really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't transmit that much either. So it, it's just uh, there seems to be a, some some sort of a threshold yeah. uh, for the virus to be able to to spread slowly and transmit, perhaps, but not causing disease. So, so in the natural bird population for this virus, which would be in Africa, one assumes somewhere in the West Nile region. Um, I suspect so. Um, I, I suspect they don't see the same sort of uh, not death much, rates. In, there's in not birds. much studies have been done with African isolates so mm -hmm. far, or in, or in Africa at least, as far as I'm aware. But it, it seems to me it's, it's a virus out of its comfort zone uh, and it's just wreaking havoc wherever it goes because it's not meant to be there. Well, I mean, the, the spread of uh, West Nile in the US was associated mainly with uh, a mosquito species yeah. uh, True. that uh, was uh, introduced into the US which was not, was not there before. Uh, and the virus somehow adapted to these uh, mosquitoes uh, very well. Which mosquitoes is that? The Kulik's. Uh, Kulix pipians or Kulix uh, species, yeah. Uh, Kulix, I can't remember. Pipians is a, is a, is a host here. I uh, suspect the same probably in the States. But, um, and, 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 you know, it happened to encounter a new territory where, you know, there was no immunity to this. And it just, just wiped through it. Uh, and now most people in the US, I suspect, are immune. Uh, and that's why we saw a, a significant drop in the infections until 2012. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what happens in 2012, where it just got up again. I um, think it's related to drought in part. So probably, my yeah. colleague De Pommier believes that when, it, when there's a drought, so normally mosquitoes feed on birds, but when there's a drought, the birds are gone, so the mosquitoes feed on people instead. So that's kind of a simplistic explanation. But if you look at the outbreaks, they do track with drought years. And 2012 was a big drought year. In the and, and in particular, it was broken by, by rain, particularly in the yeah. areas where, uh, yeah. where it was seen most, around Dallas, for example. Wasn't that uh, yeah. part of the issue, right. that the absence of the birds plus a sudden burst in mosquito population? Yeah. But in Australia, it actually was another way around. So it's after the floods that uh, the outbreak really? in horses occurred uh, down south, where the population was probably also not, not immune, haven't seen yeah. the virus before. Well, uh, so the you know, simplistic explanations are always problematic, but... But that would breed more point. mosquitoes, right? More water? Yeah. yeah, but that's not, that's not really clear whether that, that's what's caused it, really. Um, 
maybe moving the, also moving migrations of birds down, down south because of the floods. So you also talked about an, R an RNA that's a subfragment of the genome of, that was dengue? Oh, or it was Kunjin and Kunjin. West Nile dengue, any flood viruses. It's this a small is a RNA that's produced, and it's produced by an endonuclease in cells, right? Uh, yeah, it's a small RNA fragment derived from the three prime untranslated region. We call it SFRNA, and it's produced by cellular enzyme called exoribonuclease. 5 prime, 3 prime exoribonuclease, XRN1. And uh, when XRN1 digests the viral genomic RNA from the 5 prime end, it encounters, encounters this uh, highly structured region in the 3 prime UTR, right. and it stops. And, and that's how this SFRNA is made. So, but it also it doesn't just stop, it remains bound to it. And, and this process inactivates that enzyme, and, uh, which has a massive uh, consequences for the cell. Uh, RNA decay machinery, so it stops cell RNA from degradation, and then right. become a, you get a pool of a large pool of uh, uh, very stable RNAs mm -hmm. in cells. Um, so this is one of the mechanisms. And we also found that it inhibits, in collaboration with other people, and uh, with my former postdoc in Netherlands, that inhibits DICER as well. So it seems to inhibit the RNAi pathway, which is good for the virus, right? Uh, well, those are answers that we don't know yet. Okay. It must be good, otherwise our virus doesn't, wouldn't have it. So when we made a mutant virus that cannot make this RNA by introducing a certain mutation in those structures, uh, and this virus was highly attenuated um, in, in, in cells and in mice. And, and uh, uh, so the absence of this RNA made virus more vulner vulnerable to the antiviral response as well. So presumably the pool of RNAs that accumulates as a consequence of getting rid of RNA decay, those must be beneficial as well. Well, I suspect so. You have uh, to find it, out. It, yeah. it allows the virus to be uh, more resistant to interfering response. We know that. Yeah. And there was just a paper on Monday, as I said, it came out Monday, that dengue SFRNA, for example, binds to the particular proteins in the processing bodies that are involved in, in decay and, and inhibits it. And, and that leads to inhibition of translation of RNAs for, for the different uh, interference stimulatory what, molecules. What, what does that tell us about where, where the viral RNA is located within the cell? I mean, my, my vision of the way viruses replicate, particularly the flaviviruses, is that the, the RNA machinery is compartmentalized in these vesicles, and yep. it's not, not free and roaming around in the cell. So how is it they are engaging with all these well, different the, players? Well, the, uh, the RNA decay in, in general in cells occurs in a, in a specific compartment called processing bodies. So and stress granules and processing bodies are uh, major components that are you know, in exchanging uh, between each other for when, when it comes to the decay of uh, the, the RNAs that cells don't need anymore. Yeah. And it appears that uh, because uh, the, the West Nile is, is, is a replicates to a very high levels, uh, cells try to get rid of it, the excess of this RNA by, by shoveling it into, into the processing bodies. And that's where we see more, more, most of the, uh, of the binding and effects of this SFRNA molecule is occurring with the proteins that are located within the processing bodies. Uh, and, and processing bodies also involve RNAi machinery as well. Uh, and, uh, and now they've shown that it also, the, the, the components of process, processing bodies are involved in the interferon response, which is a reasonably new finding. So it looks like. Uh, Viruses uses this, um, this, this process, cellular process, to get rid of its own RNA to generate this uh, resistant uh, RNA molecule that uh, ten tends to um, essentially suck out the RNA binding proteins from the yeah. cell and uh, inactivates them. It's amazing. I think it's amazing. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised because viruses are parasites and they have to steal things. But every time I hear an example like this, it's just brilliant. But it can't degrade the whole genome because no, no, it, it leaves it leaves this this RNA molecule uh, a small piece of RNA by right. by but, um, nucleotides, but which, some, which then ties up all the other proteins, you know. But some you have uh, some full length full length thing. remain, yeah. obviously, because yeah, you yeah, need to make it large so then, yeah. But it's it, it's uh, it's uh, encircled into into specific vehicles where the RNA replication complexes is uh, uh, assembled, and then that's been shown for, for And that protects so it from being... It protects it from RNA degradation. Oh. So that was, that was central to my question before. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that quite, quite a lot of the RNA that is synthesized 
doesn't stay inside well, the vesicles, it must leak well, out. It must, it must be yeah. the case, because otherwise how, do, how does the RNA will end up in the processing bodies? Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. So the, the uh, sites of RNA replication are probably that way to protect them. Yep, yep. It's same, and so we've been saying for years that, oh, it's a surface and polymerization is better on a surface. I bet it's for reasons like this. And I'll bet in polio there's some reason that we don't know that the RNAs are on the surface of a vesicle. Or in your case, it's inside a invagination. It's inside right? the, 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 the yeah. double sort of layered vesicles uh, that a number of labs are shown now. It's, it's also thought that that helps sequester the, particularly the double-stranded intermediate away from yeah. uh, some yeah. of the interferon uh, exactly. recognition machinery. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But some, some of it must remain free uh, and uh, ended up in the processing bodies. Sure. Although, I mean, there are also papers from, from Margot Biden lab showing that uh, RNA replication can in also occur in, in processing bodies as well. So the components of processing bodies are crucial for RNA replication, um, in, in particularly the synthesis of minor strand RNA. I'm not sure how that, that goes together with uh, replication complexes with those in, within those vesicles. Um, RCs and modified PBs. Uh, Maybe, I'm not, maybe, yeah. I'm not, yeah, it could be, could be. Could be. Yeah. It's, it's a research story, project yeah. in the waiting. <laughs> it's uh, interesting, yeah. So, Gilda, what uh, turns you on? What turns me on? Well, that's a, that's <laughs> a load of questions. <laughs> Stick to virology. <laughs> We're talking about viruses. Well, yeah. Viruses. So, as I mentioned, I've got into HIV prevention, and particularly in women. And um, if you think about the HIV epidemic, 50% of individuals who are infected are women, and that reaches 59% in sub-Saharan Africa. And you could say, look, you know, a woman, can I say, talk about vaginas and condoms? Because that's where this conversation is going to go. Of course, yeah, yeah, we're adults. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that male condoms prevent HIV, yes. but uh, women in certain contexts can't um, negotiate their use. So in the 1990s, there was a field that sort of emerged called microbicides, which is a bit of a misnomer because essentially the, the newer microbicides are really antiviral agents. But right. what microbicides are are, are um, uh, ways to deliver um, agents to block um, HIV and transmission in women. They can be gels, they can be delivered as intravaginal rings. Um, now we've got more sophisticated, um, we've got um, long injectables as well for prevention. And so, um, you know, we get, I got into that um, in, the, in 2004, and that was a collaboration with a company um, here in Melbourne called Star Pharma. And we had this um, integra integrated preclinical clinical program grant to develop, to develop dendromas as microbicides. And they're fairly broad acting. Um, they block HIV and uh, herpes simplex. And herpes simplex is actually a cofactor for HIV acquisition in women. Um, but uh, things have evolved from then, and so I decided I wanted to develop my own um, antiviral drug uh, for HIV prevention. And uh, we dis decided to um, focus on the HIV reverse transcriptase. So going back to the love of my life, RT, <laughs> reverse transcriptase. Is it heart shape? Uh, no, <laughs> not exactly. And so, so, sorry. so I should say that you know there are there are drugs. So there's Trivada that's actually been um, approved for by the FDA for HIV prevention in individuals who are at high risk of acquiring HIV. So this is this is a tablet taken orally mm -hmm. to prevent HIV transmission, and um, that drug is composed of um, two reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And these drugs are actually used for therapy. Right. So we're thinking, oh gee, you know, I mean, it's great we need to get those out um, because they'll make a difference provided yeah. individuals use them. Right. Uh, but um, the problem is that you know you might get you're likely to get drug resistant virus. I mean, that's what. HIV does, and that, you know, in terms of uh, when there's selective pressure, if there's um, a drug. So we thought, okay, let's, um, you know, we want to develop a drug um, that is distinct to the inhibitors used in, in the clinic or being developed for HIV prevention, whether that's topical pre-exposure prophylaxis, microbicides or oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And we got together, so I like to collaborate with people, so I got together with um, a group of um, chemists, even though I've got a chemistry background, I've probably forgotten all the chemistry I did in undergrad. So um, Monash Institute for Pharmaceutical Science, Sciences around here, so we um, got into this um, new paradigm for drug discovery called fragment-based drug discovery. And so the idea here is that a fragment is half the size of uh, a regular molecule or small molecule inhibitor. And we wanted to use these fragments to find novel allosteric 
um, inhibitors mm -hmm. of HIV reverse transcriptase. So the two drugs that are used in the clinic are that block RT, I mean the two classes, there's only two classes of drugs, sorry, um, and one of them is an allosteric inhibitor. And we're okay. thinking, well, you know, this is a large molecule, it flops around, its activity is important, uh, that conformational change is important for its activity, um, that there'll be other allosteric sites that we could exploit uh, for uh, finding new drugs. So uh, the way we went about doing this, so getting into a bit of biochemistry and biophysics, which um, is interesting, but I like, you know, I like doing that, is um, trying to, okay, so with fragments, one of the advantages is that you don't, that um, it's very efficient in um, uh, probing the chemical space. So if you have a regular small molecule screen, you'd have to screen hundreds and thousands of uh, molecules in your library. But with fragments, you only have to screen a thousand to get a hit. But the thing is that um, with these molecules, they're, um, because they're so small, they're very weak binders. So you need to use biophysical type assays to detect their binding. And so we used saturation transfer difference NMR, STD NMR, uh, which um, is a way to detect these weak binding molecules and you can have a, a, a cocktail of drugs and you can put it through and you can detect it. Essentially what it is is um, magnetising your target, which is the reverse transcriptase, so giving it a, a, subjecting it to a magnetic field. And if the fragment binds to your target, that being the RT, then when it comes off the RT, it will release a spectra and you can detect um, that it's, it's a binder. So we've done this screen and we've actually got some hits that um, um, bind to RT and then we had another a secondary um, assay which was to look for function. So it's great with reverse transcriptase, you can express it you know, in the lab and it's got activity. So we actually did a functional assay to see if these hits could block reverse transcriptase activity and some of them did which was great, it was about a 14% hit rate. So even, the ones though even though they're weak binders, they still... Yeah, and you know, that's a good point because you have to do these assays in such a way that you're not going to get precipitation because if, if your, your drug or, or the RT precipitates out, then you know, obviously it's going to be, it looks, it looks like an inhibitor, but it's really not. So we took precautions you know, to make sure that what we had wasn't due to, you know, false positive. And then we did more characterisation of some of these. So it was important that we show that these fragments could block um, an NRTI resistant RT because that's one of the drugs yeah, classes. Yeah. And uh, we got three molecules that could do that, that could block. And then we did some further characterisation and found that some of these had mechanisms of action that are distinct to the RT inhibitors used in the clinic. So one of them is able to inhibit the RT by um, competing with a template primer, which is a different mechanism. And there's another one that could um, inhibit by competing with the DNTP, but it's not like a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Um, it's an allosteric inhibitor. So we did this Hail Mary experiment, because there's such a small, <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that, but um, there's such a small molecule okay that me. we thought, let's, let's, <laughs> throw it into, let's throw it into cell culture and yeah. see if it could block HIV okay. replication in cell culture. And uh, this particular molecule that I talked about, that competing with the template primer, actually was able to block HIV replication at concentrations that didn't kill the cell. And then we did this, what's called a time of addition study. Mm -hmm. So you vary the addition of your drug post-infection. Um, and uh, when we did that, and you have to control these experiments really well, so we had um, uh, defined reverse transcriptase inhibitors and entry inhibitors. But what we found was that this molecule appears to be acting um, at re the reverse transcription step, so consistent with a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So this is all early stages, yeah, and it's yeah. a collaboration. I should mention people, I mean, there's people at MIPS, Monash Institute for Pharmaceutical Sciences, um, David Chalmers, uh, with the mechanistic stuff. We collaborate with Nicholas Lou Kremer, who's at the University of Pittsburgh. And with fragment-based drug design, you have to know where it binds, ultimately. So that's something that's coming down the track. And we're collaborating with Eddie Arnold, who's at Rutgers University yep. in New Jersey, to see where these molecules bind. Which is a half hour from my house. Is it? You, know, oh, so okay. you must know Eddie Arnold. I'm all the way here to Australia, and you 
Sorry, sorry any, about that. No, it's okay. Actually, on the way from the airport, <laughs> I passed a billboard. It said Jersey Boys. Oh, yeah. And Jersey Boys is, I live in New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. Four seasons mm -hmm. started in New Jersey. I come to Australia <laughs> to see a sign about New Jersey. It's just so funny. But see, that's <laughs> the, the brilliance of doing a postdoc it's overseas. A you, know, you make the connections yeah, with people yeah. overseas. And as, as when I was in the golf lab, too, there were some really good connections. There were some people there that I... Overlap with you must know Theodora Hatsianu, sure. who's now working at the Aaron Diamond. She's actually got a big story out the last um, couple of weeks um, in science, where they've got this um, um, macaque model, which um, supports replication mm -hmm. of uh, yeah. HIV. So yeah, you should have her on the show maybe one day. <laughs> it's happening a bit in reverse too. But anyway, we're getting, anyway, we're getting Americans coming back back to this uh, to Australia to do postdocs. <laughs> so but anyway, um, when you're thinking about HIV prevention in women. So I sort of going going from virology into bacteriology a little bit because we're thinking about the vagina, right? And it's not sterile, it's colonised yes. with bacteria. So the other thing yeah. that we're looking at is metabolites that are produced by bacteria found in the female reproductive tract. And so you can have women who have lactobacillus dominated flora yeah. and they're supposed to be the beneficial bacteria. And um, when you look at the vagina, you know, the pH is low and, lacto and uh, lactobacilli produce a lot of lactic acid. Mm -hmm. And you've got the other side of the coin where you have women with bacterial vaginoses, right, which is an imbalance in the, in the bacteria. You get an increase in the pH and uh, you have a decrease in lactic acid. So we were collaborating with, and we're still collaborating with, Richard Cohn and Tom Munch at um, Johns Hopkins University. And we were asking the question, what is the virucidal activity of lactic acid? So we're looking at the, the, the virucidal, but we've also now gone, gone into the immune modulatory effects, which probably isn't ready for prime time at the moment, but uh, <laughs> so we're looking at that too. Um, so the interesting thing we found was, oh yeah, you know, lactic acid inactivates HIV, but um, it's more potent in inactivating HIV than just acidity alone. So if you had media acidified with HCl to say pH yeah. 3.8, yeah. yeah. Right, we only see about a less than a tenfold decrease um, in infectivity. But if you have lactic acid at physiologic concentrations at pH 3.8, you see five log decrease, and it's really rapid. And then we thought, okay, let's look at acetic acid, which is another membrane permeant carboxylic acid. And funnily enough, acetic acid is is present more in the BV state, uh, women with BV. And we found that lactic acid was far more potent than acetic acid in inactivating HIV. Um, and the interesting thing with lactic acid is, you know, what is the mechanism? You know, what is it doing in terms of um, what's the virucidal activity? So this is something, a work in process, but it just doesn't simply disrupt the virion. The um, GP120 envelope proteins are still on the outside. Um, so we were thinking that could be the obvious target, but, but now we're thinking that actually, because it's membrane permeant, it might be getting into the virion and affecting um, proteins inside there. And uh, sp specifically, you know, affecting reverse transcriptase, we're coming back to reverse transcriptase, but we use that as a marker to see whether the, vi the um, lactic acid was getting in to the virions. So you'll take some virus, treat it with lactic acid, um, bust it up and just do an RTSA. RTSA we yeah. have to neutralize it. I mean, it's sure. similar to the story you talked about today with zinc, you know, where we yeah. we um, we treat the virus with lactic acid, but we have to neutralize, neutralize it, sure, if you before we it put it on the cells because you kill the cells, right? Of course. So it's quite really well, you, you can dilute it. Yeah. It would also mess up we the RT, it right? Yeah. If you didn't know that it was getting in, it would yeah. mess up the RT. Yeah. So uh, where is this going in a therapeutic manner? Like, All right. So the lactic acid part, um, so what we're wanting to do, we're doing structure activity relationship studies to see whether we can come up with a version of lactic acid that's active um, independent of pH. So what I didn't say is that the, while you know it's the activity is greater than pH alone, it, it does depend on the pH. Uh, with lactic acid, it, it actually exists in two states depending on the pH. So it, if it's acidic pH, you've got the protonated form of lactic acid, which is the membrane permeant form. But if you go to neutral pH, um, it's not active. We actually showed that and we published that last year. So the issue with that is, you know, if you want to prevent HIV transmission in women, that semen can, is, has buffering activity and can, and can increase the um, natural acidity in the vagina to neutral. And so something like lactic acid isn't going to work unless, you know, you can provide enough. So if you provide enough lactic acid, you can overcome it. Um, so we want to come with, up with something that's... Mm. Yeah, that's, that would have to be 
the women would have to put that in before sex, yeah. right? Which is hard because sometimes, yeah. especially if you're talking about prostitution, mm -hmm. there's no time, right, to be fooling around unless you do it in the morning. And yes. So I, I don't know. I, I worry but, about but these approaches, the, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. But there's, a, there's, another, be, but there's another way to look at it, too, yeah. um, in terms of an intravaginal ring that releases lactic yeah. acid. Yeah, yeah. And um, in particularly, you know, if women, is, women are HIV infected, Right. If you decrease the amount of infectious yeah. virus being released into the vagina, that could also decrease transmission to men. And um, there's other work in, on bacteria, on BV, which um, Richard Cohn has published. And um, with um, lactic acid, it's actually more active against BV-associated bacteria compared to lactobacilli. Okay. And the other idea is to prevent BV, because BV... <laughs> BV is, is actually a risk factor uh, for acquiring HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. I was going to ask you, is there a microbiome associated protection? Well, there's is some data, say? yeah, there's some data suggesting that if a woman has lactobacillus dominated flora, um, that uh, they're protected by twofold against HIV acquisition. And interestingly enough, if uh, a woman who's HIV infected has BV, as BV, they can increase acquisition of HIV to men by threefold. So there's some data suggesting that the microbiota can impact on um, acquiring sexually transmitted infections. Yeah. So the advantage here is that maybe it's hard to get resistant to lactic acid or whatever. Yeah, but I've been asked, you know, we've presented this at meetings, and I've been asked, you know, have you been able to generate virus that's resistant to lactic yeah. acid? So that's something, you know, that yeah. we're, gonna, we're going to try to do because that could be quite informative regarding the mechanism. Knowing viruses, you'll get resistance, right? <laughs> well, I hope so, but it could be multi. <laughs> there could be multi sites of, yeah. of action. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so thank you. And that brings us to you, Paul. I know you, your first love is NS1 of dengue. Correct. However, can we talk about koala retroviruses? Because <laughs> you also work oh, on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to. No, 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 that's fine. I'm uh, equally have fallen in love with a koala as well. <laughs> How can you not? Exactly. <laughs> Cute and cuddly. So I spoke with someone yesterday who works on the chlamydial infections. Correct. Yeah. Koalas, yeah. which is a problem. But you uh, are working on a retrovirus. Tell us about that. Yeah, it all, all started, um, th this was one of those little hobby projects and uh, I expected it to last no longer than one honor student. Um, <laughs> a, um, a veterinarian uh, called John Hanger uh, contacted our department back in the early 2000s uh, about uh, pursuing research on, on this retrovirus that he'd actually discovered as part of his PhD. Um, he'd been a, a vet at this local theme park for, for many years. And he was just, they had a colony of koalas, about 80, 80 animals, and he was just very tired of having to design a breeding program that was uh, replacing all the animals that died. Mm -hmm. He had an exceptionally high, high uh, rate of uh, death from uh, cancers, from uh, leukemias and lymphomas in particular. And so he, he approached the university back in the mid 90s uh, mm -hmm. to say, look, can I come and work on this? Um, there's been a suggestion that it might be a retrovirus, but no one knows. And um, so he did his PhD on that and discovered by the end of his PhD this uh, full length um, transcriptionally active retrovirus, which he named Corv, or Koala Retrovirus. But he, went, he finished his PhD, went back to being a vet, and nothing further happened. And uh, so he, um, he contacted the department, and I put my hand up and went down and talked to him. Didn't get any free rides at the theme park, but <laughs> he, he bought me a coffee. And, uh, and I thought it would be a simple project um, because we were talking about these disease rates. He'd identified Corv, so I did what my infectious disease person always does. Let's design an assay, you know, a PCR-based assay to detect which animals have it, and that will give us the answer. Um, the student did the uh, experiments, didn't believe her data because uh, uh, the result ca came back that uh, every animal we tested was positive. Uh, we were doing genomic DNA at the time, so... Um, this was from blood, I presume? This was from blood. So, uh, well, it's either highly prevalent or, or we've got a contamination issue. We sorted out the fact that it wasn't a contamination I issue and, uh, and uh, then um, I turned, turned my thoughts to, well, maybe it's about being transcriptionally active and so let's look in the blood. And uh, she looked in the blood and we looked at um, RNA levels in the blood and we found every koala had RNA. 
So From this theme park, right? Yeah. So it was a, a trend. Again, this was clearly transcriptionally active. There was circulating virus. Uh, the animals uh, ranged from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 9 genome equivalents per mil, which was, for every animal, was surprising. I thought, well, inbred, relatively inbred colony. Let, let's look at the wild animals. So we then got in touch with a, uh, we have things called koala hospitals here. Uh, where people uh, pick up by, you know, <laughs> koalas suffer from, from attacks from dogs, they, they get hit by cars, uh, and a lot of them are sick, and uh, caring, yeah, caring individuals. Doped up on um, those gum leaves, right? <laughs> doped, 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 how much can a koala bear? Yeah. Anyway, um, the, uh, the animals are brought into these koala hospitals where they're yeah. where nurtured back to health. A lot of them have um, chlamydia infections, as you've, as you've heard. And, um, and some have to be euthanized. So we, we, we were able to get some samples from, uh, from wild ko koalas and that, uh, from that uh, quarter. They were all positive. By the end, we'd tested just a little over 200 animals. Every single koala was positive and they were all viremic. So this was really strange. So we, we were obviously looking at an exogenous retrovirus that was rampaging its way through the local koala population. We weren't quite sure what to do. So we extended the geographic range of that study, and that's when the really big surprise turned up. And a lot of koalas from south, the southern part of Australia, and particularly uh, on this island called Kangaroo Island off uh, South Australia, um, had a much lower prevalence. In fact, all of the animals we tested from Kangaroo Island had no uh, presence of the virus at all, and we really followed through. Sharon, what? Why Kunjin? Yeah, lady yeah. virus and retrovirus. There's no Kunjin on. on well, there was no Kunjin in the south parts, but yeah, in your yeah, history. yeah. Uh, it's a mosquito thing. <laughs> whereas, whereas we don't, we don't. Uh, there's a possibility. You never know that the, this retrovirus is carried by mosquitoes, but we don't, we don't know. Um, the so so what we were looking at was this exogenous virus that was obviously moving its way down the population, but... Um, we don't the, know how it spread among koalas. We right? don't know how it spread. It's probably contact, direct contact. But, yeah. but you know, it, it's, it's spreading quite quickly because what we subsequently found, we've gone back to Kangaroo Island twice now, and each time we went back, there is now... First time we found low percentage of uh, the animals now had um, the virus, and the next time we went back, there was a bigger percentage. But in the meantime, um, the PhD student working on this project, uh, Rachel Tarlington, very talented PhD, she was a vet who was interested in doing this project, um, did some seminal work. We, the, the Royal Brisbane Hospital was doing single cell PCR at the time, so we thought that let, let's test to see whether this thing is in the germline, whether it is truly endogenous. So we actually um, got ourselves a few koala testicles and uh, and actually looked at <laughs> it's, a stra it's a strange thing when you walk into your why, lab why and you see three three koala <laughs> testicles <laughs> <laughs> they're relatively easy to get oh, in is that brain, one? Right? Okay. anyway so, <laughs> so using single cell PCR but also in situ hybridization we, um, like Woody Allen I'm very uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> they were squeezed uh, anyway um uh, we, we found the, the presence of, um, of, um, of corv smattered right through the, um, uh, the genome of these uh, sperm, sp sperm cells. So it was clearly in the germline. So here we were dealing with this, what appeared to be both an endogenous and an exogenous form. So w we were assuming at the time that this is a, a virus that's in the process of endogenizing a, a population's genome. Have you genome. looked in over? Not yet, no. No, no one, we keep talking about doing that, but we've, we've, we've not yet done it. Uh, certainly, it's very unfortunate there, there are a lot of animals who are euthanized, so it would, it would be easily accessible. Um, one of the working hypotheses at the moment, and it's, it's still a working hypothesis because the tools are very difficult. There aren't too many companies you can go and buy uh, uh, reagents <laughs> for, for koala uh, mm -hmm. material. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the working hypothesis is like all, this is a gamma retrovirus, and like all gamma retroviruses, uh, we suspect that it suppresses the immune response and has the capacity to induce cancers in cells, turn cell, um, induce neoplasia. So the two prominent things we see in the koala population, at least in terms of their disease present, uh, presentation, are cancers like leukemia and lymphoma and chlamydia, uh, a classic uh, opportunistic infection of immunosuppressed individuals. Uh, there's been a lot of work on, on what might be the, 
um, mechanism for the immune suppression. Uh, there's been um, decades of work on a small peptide that is found in the envelope uh, protein of most, of particularly gamma retroviruses, that in isolation has been shown to suppress immune cells in vitro. And uh, CORV has exactly that sequence, uh, so it's highly conserved. So um, th that's, that's what we're, we're currently trying to tease apart. Do you but know in, in zoos around the world that get koalas from from this country, or do they have the infection? Or Virtually all of them are positive. Because um, they've come from here. Right? Because they've come from here. Uh, there, there are some negative uh, animals uh, in um, uh, the zoo in um, Japan. Uh, a um, colleague uh, called Taka Mirazawa has been looking at uh, koala retrovirus in, in Japanese uh, uh, zoo animals. And he, he's identified a, a population that are free of the virus, like, like we have, and it, they tend to have come from Southern Australia, whereas the Queensland mm -hmm. animals that they get, uh, they import, are positive. And uh, Mary Beth Iden in the States has also mm -hmm. identified um, uh, the virus, particularly in the Los Angeles uh, zoo animals. We know where the virus came from into koalas. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. When, when it was first sequenced, when John Hanger first sequenced it and he did the usual blast search, what uh, came up as the closest match was gibbon ape leukemia virus. Mm -hmm. But really, really close. Uh, if you actually drew a phylogenetic tree, you would almost say that they're, you know, they're, they're variants of the same virus. Is that present here in Australia? No. We no. don't have a lot of gibbons, but they're in, in Southeast, <laughs> they're, they're in Southeast Asia. And one of the working uh, ideas at the moment is that uh, um, there is a third species that may have been the source for this and that's it's like quite possibly the rodent. We, we've now recently identified a full-length retroviral sequence in a native Australian rodent which um, whose sequence falls smack dang in between um, mm -hmm. uh, gibbonate leukemia virus and koalas so so we're chasing that as well. Um, we, the um, uh, Taka in, in Japan and Mary Beth have all identified these variants now as well which is pr probably the most um, exciting data that's come out of recent analysis of the CORV populations. Um, and Taka and, and Marybeth have shown that um, um, their variants, which, which they've found, actually infect uh, via a different receptor usage. And when you look at the sequence, it's just a short stretch of about 30 amino acids in exactly the right receptor binding domain of the envelope gene in the VRA region uh, that has been um, uh, deleted and a new, a new sequence inserted. So there appears to be a recombination hotspot at that point that's actually allowing these uh, functionally uh, active um, recombinants to, to change receptor usage. We've recently done some deep sequencing on uh, a number of animals, leukemic and non, and uh, we're now seeing multiple variants at that point, so that they all show full open reading frame, mm -hmm. um, but uh, different sequences uh, cut and slotted into this one particular place. So we're not quite sure what's going on there. Mary Beth has interpreted the, uh, the presence of Corf B in her uh, data um, to disease association because she only found those variants in animals that had lymphomas. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that uh, you know we have a marker now for, for disease progression. Are these variants in Australia as well? Yes, so we've now found them. Uh, so um, Taka's variants were different. There's a, um, a worker, in a, an American working in Berlin now, Alex Greenwood, who's found different variants. Mm -hmm. and now by doing deep sequencing we're finding a whole range of these variants and it's, it's all most of them in a hot spot in this one in envelope region. There's also um, um, uh, repeats um, in the non-translational region, which is, is affecting promoter activity, enhancing it, in fact. So this has the potential to wipe out the koalas, in, right? In well, Australia, or does it? Is that a how far over? south does it go? Well, as I said, we've now found it on Kangaroo Island. So we've, if we found it in most populations, the Tasmania. There are no koalas in Tasmania. We should move all our koalas to Tasmania. <laughs> Quite possibly. Well, the ones get that don't have facial, cool. get facial cancer. Absolutely. We should screen them They'll and put the them down one. there. Oh, yeah, the sure. Tasmanian we, Devon. We've talked yeah. about Phillip Island, quarantining. we could pull the bridge down. They've got them. <laughs> Kangaroo, uh, Phillip Island has, uh, has koalas on it. Uh, we've talked about quarantining, but the reality is, uh, and it's, it's actually a big, it's a hard sell yeah. associating um, presence of this virus with disease amongst the koala community and some some uh, researchers, some communities. <laughs> the koala some, some community. Workers, there's a the huge representatives of the koala community. There's a huge <laughs> koala community. These are the uh, yeah we've seen him. He collects money for the world. We're activists. Uh, these are the individuals thing. who 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 um, are care activists about. and activists, care about yeah. koalas. Yeah. Yes, we all care um, about koalas. But there are, in the research community, there are some that don't, don't really believe this theory either. They, they, mm. they, they don't like the, the sort of the retrovirus scare component to it. Mm. 
Uh, th the reality is uh, there isn't, presence does not equal disease, and that's what they have problems understanding. And uh, so we're trying to educate in the, in the context that, that that's not always the case. And to get back to your original question, no, we don't think this is going to push koalas to extinction. There might be other things that will. Uh, the koala population is crashing at the moment, but it's probably a combination of uh, habitat destruction, mm -hmm. increasing urbanisation, we're taking away its habitat. Um, um, because of that urbanisation, they're more exposed to cars and, and dogs and so on. So um, there are some populations in South East Queensland that have disappeared completely. And that's happening down the eastern coast of Australia. It's not quite, the, it's actually on, <laughs> the irony is on Kangaroo Island, um, it may stop now that the virus has got onto the island, but in fact, uh, koalas are considered a pest. They've actually pushed two eucalypts to extinction because they've out outfed themselves on the island. <laughs> so it's, it's, a complex, it's a complex issue. So uh, the fellow I spoke with yesterday is immunizing koalas uh, for the chlamydial infection. Is that, a, is that a, an option for koala retrovirus? Well, as it happens, we're, we're collaborating with that, with that group. Peter Timms is leading the group, and, uh, and uh, they are, in fact, using that opportunistic uh, vaccination strategy to try CORV as well. Um, um, uh, a but you must German be running colleague. out of negative mm. koalas. Well, it, it's about whether that actually suppresses the um, uh, the viremic load. If if the viremic load is driving, so one of the one of the um, hypotheses we have, and one of the things we observed, in fact, in the very early days, is if you take even in these viremic animals, if you take um, tissue samples at autopsy, it, no matter what t tissue you look at in these animals that have carried this virus for life, they have virtually an identical insertion profile, like a classic endogenous retrovirus. And this is despite huge viremic carriage. And this is the classic story with retroviruses, there's restriction to superinfection. And, and, and gi given that, it's not likely to, uh, to infect. However, given that high level carriage, I suspect there's breakthrough. And that could be the reason for the, for the uh, occasional um, uh, appearance of these um, uh, neoplastic cells. And so if you suppress that, uh, suppress the carriage, whether it's a vaccine or not, then that may actually ameliorate. The huge problem, of course, is we're dealing with a wild animal population here. They're not wild, you're they're not furry go out. and they're cuddly. And yeah, you're not going to go out vaccinated. Uh, that is true. How, how many are there in Australia, do we have any idea? No, well, there's thought to be about uh, 20, 000, 15 to 20,000 on, on Kangaroo Island. I'm not sure about the total population around Australia. It's but certainly it is decreased. When I was a kid growing up on Phillip Island, it, the koalas were everywhere. You, you can't find one now. I mean, you really can't. A lot of tourists looking for koalas. Yeah, yeah, sure. But not many yeah. koalas. The problem is if you immunize, and, but then they're going to pass the endogenous virus onto offspring, then they'll be viremic and exactly. you have to keep. So no. the best thing is to. I don't know, eventually all the infected ones will die, replace them with uninfected Or, or alternatively, or they'll do what we've done. I mean, we carry as 8% of our genome retroviruses. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that um, the population will eventually suppress the transcriptional activity and, um, and, and the survivors will go on to, group, to generate a new population of yeah, endogenized animals. Super koala. That may take a long time. It may take yeah. a long time. Yeah. But, then but, wiped the, out, right? but we didn't get wiped out. So, well, um, you know, our precursors got wiped out, yeah. right? Almost certainly, but we're the evidence that not yeah. all of them, yeah. all of them disappeared. Yeah. So I suspect, you know, at the moment, probably all we can do, <laughs> all we can do, wow, is is all we can do is monitor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we get deep on Twitter, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and we started with koalas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did start. That's right. Well, this is Australia after all. <laughs> yeah. um, in, I just read a review article about this that you wrote, and at the end you say, this is fascinating. We're seeing endogenization in real time, and that lets us study it. Now, wh uh, what would you study in real time? Why is that an advantage? Well, the effects on the population, it was exactly the questions yeah. we're asking. You know, are, are, the, are these um, species extinction events? How does a host actually respond to this? What, what, how, do, how do the silencing effects happen? Um, mm -hmm. So our, mm -hmm. our endogenous retroviral sequences are silenced. You know, they're methylated, and there are various ways yeah. in which we silence. How does that actually progress in, a, in individual animals? We've we've now done because we can do deep sequencing. We're now looking at these sequences a little bit more carefully. When we first um, did these studies, it looked like the vast majority of insertions were full length, reflecting you know le recent and en um, endogenization. Mm -hmm. But we're now finding truncations and inactivations. Mm -hmm. So that's already happening. Cool. Interesting. That's pretty neat. So um, I'll bet similar things are happening in other animals out there. We just don't look at them. Right? Ab absolutely. Kangaroos. Yeah. 
Same right. has, so they have, do they have problems? Are they getting wiped out? No, no, I'm just... <laughs> Extrapolating just a bit further, so there's another endogenous Australian uh, animal. Randomly, so randomly yeah. picking up another well, crocodile. Oh, what else is the Australian fake? icon? Um, nothing that we know of. We've anything? actually the closest uh, relative of koala is the wombat, uh, and we have actually oh, looked at the wombat. And uh, actually, one one thing it, it did allow us to do, um, because we had, we were associated through this project with a large number of vets, uh, mm -hmm. we started to acquire quite a few. Um, uh, a few samples and started just looking using retroviral uh, generic primers, just looking at the, the depth of retroviral endogenization in all these species, and they mm -hmm. really are everywhere, um, as, as some of your work with bats now um, yeah. show as well. They were, they were at the beginning, yep. probably, yeah. and so it's not surprising. Mobile genetic elements. But you know, throughout we, evolution, we species have come and gone, many <laughs> thousands and thousands of species for all different reasons, and hmm. so this could be one of them. Uh, as well, correct. Um, but as I said, there are there are animals in Queensland, whole populations mm -hmm. that are uh, that are surviving well, and, and appear to be healthy with the virus. I so, mm -hmm. so we don't know. Well, you're, you're doing genetics to figure that correct. out. Correct. Yeah. yeah, that's good. We should point out that you did a study on museum pelts, which says that this virus was there hundreds of years ago. Yeah, that wasn't our work. It was um, Alex Greenwood um, um, in in Germany, and uh, we we proposed in in our early. Um, early paper based on, I mean, actually it was John Hanger, and we sort of confirmed it with molecular clock data, mm -hmm. which is always a bit dodgy to, to use with retroviruses, <laughs> suggesting, <laughs> suggesting that uh, maybe it entered the koala genome about 100 to 200 years ago, but um, uh, th they sourced um, pelts from around Australian museums and so on, tested, and uh, the sequence they found was very similar to the generic sequence we, we found, and yeah. they, they're suggesting that it may have been uh, in koalas for thousands of years, but we, so we don't really know. But koalas have been thriving up until now, so uh, maybe they're okay with it for a long time. And now the well, confluence. Why, why not now? Well, now, now it's it, you know there are these confounding factors, as I said, population expansion. Yeah. Uh, we want to live in exactly the same place as koalas want to live. If you actually look at the uh, koala spread around uh, koala population spread around Australia, it's it's in those high density populations. Nice. Well, thank you. That's a great. Uh, Summary of some virology in Australia, right? There you yeah. go. So this episode of TWIV will be, as usual, on iTunes and at twiv.tv. And if you have any questions, send them to twiv at twiv.tv, and I'm sure uh, we'll pass them along and get them answered from the Australian virologist. Sure. Right? So I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Um, Amanda Mitchell, thank you so much. Amanda. Melissa, sorry. Melissa Churchill. Melissa Churchill. Who is Amanda Mitchell? Who is Amanda Mitchell? I have no idea. But I clearly look like her. Maybe you look like her. Melissa Churchill. I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. If she's is jet lagged, right? I mean, Vince I'll, is jet I'll lagged. Probably. That. Is she funny. wealthy? I'll be her. Amanda Mitchell. Amanda Mitchell. We'll see. Anyway, Melissa I'm going to go Churchill. Google her now. Melissa Churchill, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, Alex Cromick. That's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a real pleasure. And I'm sorry I mispronounced your name originally. That's fine. And I'm going to mispronounce yours, but let me try one more go time. Go ahead. Gilda Tashton. 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 Yeah, Tashton. Thank you, Gilda. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and yours is easy. Paul Young. <laughs> You're welcome. Mine was easy. Come back soon. Thank you. Uh, I would like to come back sometime. We'll see. Um, we'll, we'll attract with you With your family. Uh, well, that was the intention originally, but... Come, uh, come for the Varolds Meeting Society. Oh, yes. There you go. That would be fine. Would it's be being fine. held in a... Uh, a vineyard or a winery uh, next time, next year. So where, where is it? Where, where 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 that's no, no, all secret. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be New South Wales, right? <laughs> Correct. Somewhere. And then you can come up and see the Sounds lovely good. beaches in Queensland. Sounds good. You can see Sydney. Hmm. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology. WS. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>